Good evening. My name is still Christy Max Williams, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the spring season of this, the 25th year of the Arts Cafe Mystic. <clears throat> Thank you. For those of you new to the Arts Cafe, we are an independent nonprofit and our mission is to present to you the nation's most celebrated writers and poets, along with New England's finest musicians, in programs that lift your spirits while deepening your minds. And if we have a little fun along the way, well, you'll get over it. <laughs> youth, youth will be served and every dog will have its day, said the bard. Though we can never seem to wrangle any dogs to perform for you, this first show of our spring season is always a special one because it annually celebrates young artists. And what better setting for tonight's show than these galleries festooned as they are with the Mystic Museum of Art's Young at Art exhibit. Add to this some cool music and a chance to hear the great Lisa Starr read her poetry. And we have the makings of what we think will be a memorable evening. So let's get on with it. But first, <laughs> if you have one of these in your pockets or your pocketbook, won't you please remove it and Throw it onto the floor and grind your heel into it and curse it for the tyranny it exercises over your lives. <laughs> or at least turn the damn thing off. As part of our annual Youth Will Be Served show, we are pleased to introduce you and honor the Student Poets Laureate of Southeastern Connecticut's high schools. The young artists, writers, we're honoring tonight competed for and were selected for their recognition by their school's faculty. They have earned the distinction of being their school's best and brightest poets. Now, celebratory honors are a good thing, but we've also factored into the evening's festivities, some practical provisions for the students' poet laureates. First and foremost, this afternoon, they participated in a special poetry writing master class conducted by tonight's featured poet, Lisa Starr. A rare opportunity for aspiring writers to work with a nationally known poet. Indeed, they could not have a better teacher or role model than Lisa Starr. Ah, she's blushing. We're also pleased to award each of the students, each of the student poets, the very practical consideration of the Arts Cafe Prize, which entails a $100 prize check. Yeah. For those of you who are poets out there, you know that selling your poems for 100 bucks is hard to do. <laughs> so let's meet these special young people. What we'd like to do is introduce you to each of them, give them their honors, then give you a chance to hear them read some of their fine work. So, without more ado, the Poet Laureate of the Norwich Free Academy is Leika Bart Bertrand. She's in, thank you. Leika is a junior whose favorite subject is math, of all things. She's involved with many after school activities, but what she loves most is volunteering her time and talents for good causes and events. She plans to go to college, though that's way too early to, for her to say where. But at this moment, she aspires to be an architect. Her favorite poet is 
Rudy Francisco, whose name I hear a lot from young poets. Really, you should check Rudy Francisco out for his unflinchingly honest poems about social issues. There's a good YouTube video of his powerful poem, Complainers, which is Leica's favorite, as I understand. Leica reports that she writes poetry to express herself in ways that entertain the people in her orbit, orbit to make them smile, laugh, be happy. Won't you please join me in congratulating Leica Bertrand of the Norwich Free Academy. The Poet Laureate of Ledyard High is Peyton Edwards. Peyton's a senior whose favorite subjects are English and history. She's the secretary of the senior class and is an active member of YUGA, YUGA, which stands for Youth United for Global Action and Awareness. She looks forward to studying creative writing at a New England-based college. Interestingly, she admires the, poet, uh, the poetry and song lyrics of Taylor Swift. Check them out. Peyton writes poetry as an outlet for her emotions and thoughts. Thoughts, emotions, and all? Won't you please congratulate Peyton Edwards of Ledyard High. The Poet Laureate of Waterford High is Michaela Green, Mickey as she prefers. And I should add that Michaela, or Mickey, is a three-time laureate of her school. This is her third consecutive trip to this podium. <laughs> Mickey, as she prefers, is a senior who plans to attend the University of New Hampshire to study equine science in preparation for veterinary school. Apart from riding, she loves riding and working with horses. She's also a member of her school chamber orchestra and dance club and is captain of the tennis team. Mickey's favorite poem is Quite Frankly, that is the title of the poem, Quite Frankly, by Mark Halliday, a fine poem you should check out. She writes poetry because she loves the flow of words from her head onto the paper and because it gives her the freedom to express her private thoughts and feelings. Won't you please congratulate Mickey Green of Waterford High. The Poet Laureate of Stonington High is Karen Henson. Karen is a senior whose favorite subject is music. She plays both clarinet and guitar. As part of the school band, she performs at concerts and football games. She's president of her local youth volunteer organization, but she also spends a lot of time on independent art projects. Her favorite poet is the great W.H. Auden, whom she admires for his ability to create vivid, emotionally charged images. Karen plans to attend college in Boston, where she'll, she'll study film production, with hopes of working in the film industry as a writer or director. Above all, she loves storytelling in all media, including poetry. She writes poetry to work through and gain perspective on life's difficulties. Won't you please join me in congratulating Karen Hansen of Stonington High. <laughs> the 
The poet laureate of Montville High is Holly Richmond. Holly is a senior whose favorite subject is unapologetically English. <laughs> Since her freshman year, she has been heavily involved in the school drama club, and indeed she plans to major in theater studies in college with an emphasis on playwriting. She aspires to write scripts for stage and screen. Her favorite poets are the very cool Jenna Rose Nethercott and the great Maria Howe, two wonderful role models. Holly reports that she began writing poetry to cope with her anxiety disorder, but now she enjoys the way poetry enables her to express herself without necessarily being literal in what she is trying to say. Won't you please congratulate with me, Holly Richmond of Montville High. <clears throat> the poet laureate of Fitch High is Alyssa Solomon. Alyssa is a junior who loves school and excels in math, physics, and foreign language. She also plays on the school soccer team and is a member of the marching band and math team. Right now, however, she's focused on the school robotics team for which she's a programmer. When she gets to college, she plans to major in linguistics with a focus on computer science and math while doing a little music on the side with hopes that this will lead to a career in the tech industry. Alyssa admires the great poet Edna St. Vincent Millay as a feminist and for her nature poems and mastery of formal verse. Alyssa finds writing her poems to be freeing and meditative and loves finding the perfect word or phrase to express what she's imagining. Won't you please congratulate Alyssa Solomon of Fitch High. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Student Poets Laureate of the High Schools of Southeastern Connecticut. Let's get on with it. So you've met the poets. Now let's hear some of their poems. Let's begin with Peyton Edwards of Ledyard High. Good evening. My first poem is titled The Sign. It's based off of a sign that was posted on a street post by the Crystal Mall. Three, five, six, seven. Forgotten numbers ripped away by restless time and winds from passing cars. Half melted chunks of dirty snow float on the still gray waters. Neon pink stands stark against the muted bark, slowly fading. Not ch. Winds in ruthless bouts of rain assault the vibrant pink, tearing, shredding, revealing. Neon green peeks through like the frightful sun on a cloudy day, tape peeling up slowly as if waking from a well-needed slumber. St. Dog. Hope thrown into the way of the careless. Something to acknowledge with a wandering gaze. The sign soon to disappear like the message once slathered on its surface. Never to be found and stitched back together. Thank you. My next piece is titled 1259. She's trying to stay afloat but doubts keep biting at her heels as if they were sharks. And her confidence is slowly flaking away, 
along with her strength. She doesn't know how long she can tread water for. She's never been particularly good at it. She hopes for some kind of salvation, but there is no raft or flotation device in sight. No cruise ship meandering by that could save her. They all must have drifted away on the endless sea. But she wouldn't know that. She spends all her days holed up in the cage of her mind, losing all grasp on time, confused and dazed. She lets the buttery days pass her by without a care, waiting for the last grains of sand to trickle down the sides of the hourglass on summer, and her despair to fly out into the wind and sink below the sea. Or maybe she's waiting until she can submerge herself into the unforgiving waters, bide her time, and come out clean. Thank you. My final poem is titled, My Interview at Bank Square. <laughs> there was a dog at my interview with black, kinky, curly fur as soft as a cloud, rolling around next to me on the tan, sunken leather couch, beams of golden light igniting his fur, easing my nerves like a fluffy, warm blanket. There was a dog at my interview, tethered to a cherry leash with melted chocolate for eyes and a nonstop happiness meter with an errant tongue lolling about. There was a dog at my interview that wasn't bothered by the noises outside, not by the sounds of cars driving by with their music spilling out into the air, filling the pauses in between conversations, not by the chattering below on the street or the blinking signals or the impatient honks, not by the people's footfalls a floor below, picking up and setting down items, entering and exiting, making the bell above the door sing. There was a dog at my interview that made my day. Thank you. Peyton Edwards of Ledger High, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, Bank Square Books sponsors, or is one of the sponsors of this series. I can't promise you, if you visit there, you'll encounter the black dog with the nonstop happiness meter. Wouldn't you like to, though? OK, let's hear next from Holly Richmond, Poet Laureate of Montville High. <laughs> it's one way to start. <laughs> My first poem tonight will be lost, To Lost Lovers. I've written more since you've been around. I wanted to pen letters and saccharine, poems dripping with roses and contentment, the image of a perfect introvert scribbling romantic nonsense into her little black book. But the best work comes out of feeling an empty cavity where my heart was, and not to sound too dramatic, but there were times where I didn't know whether to hate you or kiss you. Cupid hunts with arrows of gold and lead, and you got the ladder, but I painted it gold and stuck it through my chest, hoping for the off chance of a glimmer of real and not fools. You are no longer the prince I thought you were. The walls I once tried to climb surrounding your heart are barbed and lined with glass. When I see you now, there is nothing in your eyes. No spark that made me fall, no humor or madness, just dull and dead. I tried, but maybe that's how you always were, and I dressed up the mannequin romancing you from outside the store window. So here I'll lie to myself with pen in hand on all the good that I found and keep finding in you. I hope she has better luck. Thank you. My next poem is called The Familiar Stranger. You visited me again last night. You curled up beside me and gave warmth to my shivering figure, but still I woke up alone. 
You visited me again last night. You held my hand as we strolled in the woods behind the school, laughing as we talked and crying as I let go of day. You held me till I woke up, a tear on my pillowcase. You visited me again last night, but not you. You were still, as I ran to greet you, your back facing me. You did not speak. You did not wear the sweatshirt or the worn jeans stained from your full speed sprint down the hill meant to impress me. You wear a suit now that has seen no sun, that has seen only shadow and something dark, something is very wrong. When you turn to face me, it is not you, no curly waves of sun, hair slicked and black like tar, the proportions all wrong. You loom, mocking, height no longer a familiar comfort. The eyes are not your own, whites are coal, irises blood. Hunger and malice thrive with a smile too wide, cold, calculating, something soulless. Thank you. My last poem for the night is titled Valkyrie. For Ryan. You were born from the tears and blood of an Amazon princess, made to fight and protect the innocent and avenge the fallen, but you chose to leave paradise and walk among the sinners. When I first met you in kindergarten, I had no idea you would wrap me in the eternal ties of fate, binding us so close we became sisters. Your lasso held tight as we slayed monsters I thought were imaginary. Trolls and dragons toppled at our will. I had no idea they were real to you. Goblins dragged us apart and you to the pit of Hades, scratching up and down your limbs, lashed you to iron shackles against a wall of despair. Worst of all, the captors painted a mask and nailed it to your mouth, an ever-present grin to hide all the pain and suffering inside a mind-shaped prison. They offered you a way out through contracts and bottles but you refused. Wielding paintbrushes and pens, you cried out for help with the souls of a thousand victims. You refused to end up the same, to, refused to appear as another statistic. A Viking horde awaits at the base of a mountain to begin the ascent to recovery. The windy city awaits your arrival. I will miss you with all my heart, all of my strength. While my eyes leak with empathy, I know you will be safe there to repair your broken wings. I love you. Thank you. Holly Richmond, ladies and gentlemen of Montville High. Thank you, Holly. Next, let's hear from Alyssa Solomon, Poet Laureate of Fitch High. Thank you. My first poem this evening is titled Daphne. Chased, she bounds across the earth until her long legs fail. A nymph who dreamed of persimmons lies motionless on a dale. She told him no, her pursuer, he and his god's ego, but he did not listen at all, following with his bow. Confused, she looked around in fear, then screaming, raced away. He laughed like cracking, stiffened whip and sprang a dazzling ray. As though a string connected them, the god and nymph ran on, her webbed fingers burning in streaks of bloody dawn. For now she gasps, oh why do you pursue despite my fears? Why care you not for anguished cries and salty, cooling tears? I see not, but a girl so fair, she simply must be mine. And who would want to reject me unless my light her blind? I do. Her voice breaks with despair. Her head drops to the ground. Father, Help me in my dire hour, if ever you hear my sound. Her feet took root into the dirt. Her hair spun into leaves. Her fingers froze into warm bark 
as her mouth opened, free. Thank you. Uh, my second poem this evening is titled, Young Heart. My heart does not flutter. It rises into my brain, a ghostly master who seizes the reins. When it catches sight of the object I currently desire, my tongue freezes or shatters, spilling out the babble of my inner choir. My brain is cultured, forewarned by century-old tales of unrequited love by girls disguised, of star-crossed lovers mourning veils, the master playwright knew it all, nigh on 400 years ago. So why must I still follow blind, my young heart dashing to and fro? Thank you. Uh, and my final piece for this evening is titled Spring. I lay in our hammock, Ropes striping my back, and knuckles linked comfortably beneath my hair, staring up through speckles of light and shadow. Hi, I greet you. It's been a while. We missed you, you whisper down, with your leaping questions and your bounding ideas. Your leaves rustle with slight impatience and the force of a thousand memories. Our pulses slowed beneath freezing sky, and you were nowhere. Our maple blood ran into a hundred tiny pots, and you were nowhere. We groaned and began to repair broken limbs after the wet, heavy thaw, and you were nowhere. Our crowns filled with the peeps and trills and shrieks of life, and still... You were nowhere. Where were you? I was hiding in the dark, warm places of my people. For I cannot stay under the freezing sky. We missed you, you say, a little louder. I know. I missed you too. But distance only makes the heart grow fonder. And I'm here now. You quiver, tremble, and settle in to dream with me. Thank you. Alyssa Solomon, ladies and gentlemen, of Fitch High. Thank you, Alyssa. Let's hear next from Mickey Green, three-time laureate of Waterford High. My first poem for you tonight is Kara, Supergirl. The crest on your chest is cursed with the same shade of red already worn on your mightier counterpart. The bold S may belong to your family, but its power is not yours. Fame doesn't recognize you, defeater of mortality and wearer of a glorified costume. You stood a chance, but what is a girl to a man? If only you were gifted the luxury of a story that was entirely your own. The second that symbol was painted on your suit, you accepted the role of accessory and gave up the ability to reign supreme. Don't worry, we don't blame you, girl of steel, for not grabbing the potential that was stolen from you that you didn't know you had in the first place. Thank you. Um, my next poem is called Loving Her Had Consequences, and this is inspired by Camila Cabello's song, Consequences. Loving her was the feel of being wild and free. 
It was a kind of ignorance that forgets the stumbles on the path and remembers only the sweet safety of quiet days spent in summer. Loving her was sunshine before it poured, before fragments of promises that would never be kept littered the ground like leaves after a particularly bad storm. It wasn't meant to last forever. Our summer eventually came to its end. In the chaos of reds and oranges that followed, I find myself lost without her. Thank you. Um, before I get to my last poem, I would like to thank everyone here for giving me the opportunity over the past three years to share my poems, and especially Lisa Starr and Christy for allowing me to work with you and giving me this platform. So thank you very much. And my last poem is titled Bones of the Earth. It's easy to pretend she's not sick. The sun still shines, and birds still trill. And it's not hard to get lost in the daydream of infinity when she seems so solid and permanent. Change comes so slowly, it's impossible to tell if it's the clouds outside or if her skin has always been that shade of gray. Have her bones always stuck out like that? Structures left behind from a better era. Her skin dries, it cracks, she fades under her fever. Then the years given turn to months, hours, minutes, and the saving grace you counted on fails to magically appear. With a final gasp, a final breath out, her last bit of life ebbs away with the tide. Goodbye, Earth. Thank you. Mickey Green of Waterford High, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mickey. Next, let's hear from Karen Hansen of Stonington High. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the first poem I'll be reading tonight is Heirloom. In the corner of my mother's room is a cedar chest. With broken hinges, the varnish faded away, buried beneath a veil of dust, corners rounded from puppy teeth. Inside, stacks of carefully folded sweaters, ferrile for Francis, cable for Christine, and seamless for Sarah knitted by my great-grandmother for each of her children. I never knew her, only of the creation she left behind. Coarse-aged wool like thousands of dry pine needles, twisted in knots, immortalizing the young statures of my relatives. I do not have one of my own. No intricate work of fiber that fits flawlessly. Instead, I have ill-fitting stories. A first day of college full of holes. A deep winter day cut too short. An irritating family photo on Christmas morning. Though they are disproportionate, I do not leave them for the moths. Each one deserves rest and respect until a future descendant grows to fill the figures. Thank you. My second poem is called The Cowboy and the Sailor. Late after the sun's last light, two men idly wait inside a bar. Sheltered from the snow, they share a drink in solitude. A beer to one, a whiskey to the other. Soon the silence becomes too thick to swallow. You know, I don't like cowboys much, said one. And I ain't a fellow who's too fond of sailors, said the other. Maybe we could find something in common. I wouldn't be too sure. We might be men of different lives, but we have the same hands, the sailor said. Rope rugged, sun hardened, 
thick-knuckled. The cowboy looked down to his palms, veritably described. All working men have the same hands. The sailor thought for a moment before responding. Our eyes are the same. I've never seen an ocean, and you've never seen the plains. The sea and the sod share a sky. We fall asleep under the same stars. You'd compare the sway of your ship to the sway of my horse? Almost. You can dismount any time you please. I can't. That doesn't make my life any easier. If I don't drive my cattle on time, I'm out of a job. I live to serve my country. You live to serve yourself. The cowboy rose from his seat, glass half empty, turned his back, and walked towards the door. Now where are you off to? To find my brother. I don't want to hug him with bloody arms. Hold up there, cowboy. I wasn't looking for a fight. The cowboy stopped and looked over his shoulder. I'll buy you a drink if you stay. I'm waiting here for my brother, too. The cowboy came back and sat. The sailor's face looked a little more familiar. Who could have guessed you'd join the Navy, brother? The sailor laughed and tapped the bar for another round. And never would I have guessed you'd ride the range. Not long after their last drink, the brothers embarked out into the storm, stumbling side by side. Thank you. My last poem of the night is titled Scarlet. There was a time I would have died for you. I would have laid down and surrendered, bled out under a blade I had wet, and gasped for your name with my last breath. There was a time I would have wandered the earth for you. I would have plucked every living flower and let their thorns shred my hands just to hear you thank me. There was a time I would have cried an ocean for you. I never thought the tears would end, and when I looked in the mirror, my face burned scarlet. There was a time I would have lost my sight for you. I felt the world slipping away, and it was always easier to close my eyes than to open my mouth. There was a time when I only saw the red of sunrise. I was trapped in between the minutes of light and shadow. And as I strained to stare at the immediate sun, I was unable to see the gilded sky behind it. But that time has died. Many of the flowers have grown back. My cheeks have cooled, and I now see again. And though the wounds may never close, scarlet always bleeds to gold. Thank you. Karen Hansen, Poet Laureate of Stonington High. Thank you, Karen. And lastly, let's hear from Leica Bertrand, Poet Laureate of NFA. Good evening, everyone. I hope that you enjoy the poetry that I have for you tonight. The first piece that I have is called We Were. If stealing my heart was basketball, you'd be the best player in the league. If loving you was a sickness, I got a cold and a disease. If your trust was a credit card, I'd pay all the fees. If your heart was a home, I'd be the first to buy the keys. I really needed you, like my legs need knees. And I felt your importance like an environmentalist to trees. But you got on my nerves like a hesitated sneeze or like someone who forgets to say thank you and please. Thoughts of you flooded my life like you was born from the seas. Your smile knocked me over like something stronger than a breeze. We fit together perfectly. You were the mac, I was the cheese. <laughs> we were honey and bees, winter and skis, potatoes and peas. The thing is, I loved you more than I love being right. 
I loved you more than a five-year-old loves light. I loved you more than the string to kite. I loved you more than the moon tonight. You see, if you asked me for the world, I'd also hand you the stars. If you told me to go, I'd only ask you how far. If you wanted to see me, I'd show you all my scars. If you wanted to move faster, I'd buy you a car. You were everything that I wanted and all I ever needed. And that was true until life interceded and for you it proceeded and your new girls conceded and you just left me alone like a wound untreated, like a message deleted, like a battle defeated, like a task completed, like a handshake ungreeted. So I guess we're not Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> I guess you're not my ride or die. I guess we're not the groom and bride. But when you left, you stole my pride. And all your truths started to look like lies. And if you told me my faults, I really would have tried. But now I guess my hands are tied and my smile's not so wide. And I think a part of my heart just died. And they say that's life. You give what you get, but I gave you my heart and you only gave me less. And when you handed it back, it was a heartbroken mess. So right here I confess to the murder of what was love for you. Arrest me now, cause all I ever had was love for you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the second poem, well, the first one was obviously heartbreak, so I wanted to cheer it up with a love poem. So this one's called, You Never Said Your First Name Was Love. When you first introduced yourself, you never said your first name was love. You didn't inform me that your walk was wine and I'd get drunk off your footsteps. You forgot to mention that your best friend is Cupid and that his arrows are strings of your heart, strings of your heart that make music sweeter than a harp, sweeter than your strawberry smile, sweeter than your raspberry laugh, sweeter than the sounds you make when your tongue forms the syllables that say my name. I love when you say my name. When you first introduced yourself, you never said your first name was love. I mean, it makes a lot more sense now because they say love is blind and I believe it because you ran into my fears, tripped over my scars and fell over my insecurities. But when you got back up, you still said, hey, when you first introduced yourself, you never said your first name was love or that your eyes are magicians. Every time you looked at me, the butterflies in my gut would disappear. You never said that your fists were confident. Whenever you knocked on the front door of my heart, anxiety would run away. When you first introduced yourself, you never said your first name was love. Talking to you was like counting sheep. I fell asleep off your words and found slumber on your voice. Caught a couple Z's on the way your lips move. Your mouth is the ocean and the waves of your lips crash on the seashores of mine. I could go on forever and ever about love, about you, because love never ends. But when you first introduced yourself, you never said your first name was love, or that your last name would soon be tied to mine. Thank you. <laughs> I'm done with love for now. <laughs> But I wanted to end my sequence of poetry with um, something that really speaks a lot of volume to me. So this last one is called Loud Silence. Don't touch me. I said, don't touch me. The blood and fear spilt on my face didn't come from nothing. You think your hands are as strong as your words. They hurt just a little bit more than the venom that spills from your mouth. Don't touch me. Don't look at me, don't even look. All I can see is the bottom of a glass that used to be filled with love, but you drank that along with my happiness. You kidnapped my pride and murdered her along with my voice. Don't look at me. Don't talk, don't say a damn word. Silence is the only good thing you forced inside of me. Silence was there even when you weren't. I don't know how you do it, cause there's fire in my throat, but peace on my tongue, so just shut up. 
Every morning, I pledge allegiance to a man that represents pain. For dinner, he serves me disrespect, and I give him everything like I owe it to him. I don't know how you convince me that I owe you everything, yet given you nothing, how I should accept hurt as if it's God's will. I don't know how you convince me that my voice doesn't matter like equality to America. Equality to America. I pledge allegiance to a man that represents pain. Silence is the only good thing you forced inside of me. You kidnapped my pride and murdered her along with my voice. The blood and fear spell on my face didn't come from nothing. This was nothing. Then you came here and sprinkled a little bit of hope into my soil and sprouted a tree, a tree that is now dying because of you. You are America. America is you. Tell me, how do you look like love and sound like hate? How did you give heaven and hell the same address? How do you invite me to the palace only to work at the gate? Why does my skin color and gender mean I matter a little less? You are America. America is you, baby. Show me. How do you cover tragedy with comedy? You look like cake, yet tastes like broccoli. How did you make your lies feel like honesty, you are America, baby, America is you, America is you, America is you, thank you. Laika Bertrand, ladies and gentlemen, Poet Laureate, of the Norwich Free Academy. Thank you, Laker. Remarkable, eh? Isn't it? Isn't it how interesting, how different the poets were from one another, but how consistently good they were? Hmm. Before we move into the musical segment of our show, I want to take a moment to recognize and thank the teachers who've played a key role in the artistic lives of these young poets. By nurturing their talent and organizing their selection as poets laureates of their schools, behind every good artist are inspiring and dedicated teachers. Let me recognize them, if you will, by name. From Fitch High, Dan Giovanazzo, from Stonington High, Mary Lou Brockett Devine. From Ledyard High, Amanda Fagan. From Montville High, Wendy Halsey. From the Norwich Free Academy, Kim Roberts. And from Waterford High, Tony Tessier. Give them a round of applause. <clears throat> <clears throat> If, if we had time, and we don't, if we had time, I would also introduce to you the parents of these kids. Hell, if we'd had time, I would introduce everybody here. <laughs> but seriously, if you are the parents of these fine, interesting kids, you have much to be proud of. And you too are to be congratulated. So, so, on with the musical interlude for our show. We're very excited about tonight's music, which will be served up by the young singer-songwriter Casey Flax. Casey has been featured in the New London Talent Show at the Guard Arts Center and last year made it through the first round of The Voice. She's a senior at Fitch High, where she is president of the Honor Society, and in her spare time plays second base on the softball team. Casey also volunteers for Unified Sports, a program that brings together students from the region with and without disabilities. And she organized the first unified dance in southeastern Connecticut. 
but it's her music that interests us tonight. So please join us in welcoming Casey Flax. Now, I would be saying names for these, but to be completely honest, I don't really have many. So the first one, I call Let It Go. This is one of the really new ones. Thank you. 
So at this point, I'm going to switch over to the guitar for a song. I came up with this song partly while I was in guitar class. Um, our teacher gives us time to work on projects, and I took the opportunity to do my own thing. Been told I haven't really been through a lot, but to me. Sorry about that. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. All right, I have two more for you, one more original, and then I'm going to finish it off with the cover. Something new, but you 
I'll put up a fight I know what you've been through But good things take time I see that you've been hurt time and time again I can see it in your eyes Your heart has been strained So look at me and even though it's hard Try to trust Cause the future could be you and me But you just can't do us You say that what you need might not be what you want but what if it was us it was us you could find call me crazy cause you may not agree but what if the best thing for you is me yeah i see that you've been hurt time and time again i can see it in your eyes your heart you need but you'll still choose to bleed if you'd only just think about it like puzzle pieces we could fit i see that you've been hurt time and time again i can see it in your eyes your heart has been strained so Cause the future could be you and me But you just can't do us <clears throat> Thank you Alright, so I'm gonna finish it off with something that's obviously a little more familiar to you guys um, I like to do my own version of Benny and the Jets. <laughs> hey kids, shake your lips together. Spotlights it in something that's known to change the weather. We'll kill the fatty calf tonight. So stick around. You're gonna hear electric music, solid walls. Jets. Oh, but they're weird and they're wonderful. Oh, Benny, she's a really keen. She's got electric boots. I'm low his suit. You know I read it in a magazine. Oh, 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 oh Benny and the Jets. Hey, kids, plug into the faithless. Maybe they are blinded, but a Benny made a mix. Let us take ourselves along Where we find our parents out in the streets To find who's right and who's wrong Say, Candy and Ronnie, have you seen them yet? They're so spaced out b -b -b and the Jets Oh, but they're weird and they're wonderful Oh, Benny, she's a really key Oh, his suit, you know I read it in a magazine. Oh, 
Lisa has twice been appointed State Poet Laureate of Rhode Island and is now Poet Laureate Emerita of the Ocean State. She's also been honored with two Rhode Island Fellowships for Poetry and has twice won the Nancy Potter Prize for Fiction. More, moreover, mover and shaker that she is, Ms. Starr also founded and for many years directed the Block Island Poetry Project, which was an important conference that gathered poets, writers, musicians, and artists from around the country. The Block Island Poetry Project concluded with her publication of a wonderful anthology, Where Beach Meets Ocean. We also have that on sale, by the way, that features poems by Billy Collins, Mary Oliver, Coleman Barks, and other famous poets who participated in the Block Island Poetry Project. Ms. Starr now lives close by in Westerly, where she heads up a monthly poetry gathering and reading and is readying a new book of her poems for publication to be called Potluck. In introducing Lisa Starr, I'm always mindful of William Blake's famous pronouncement from his Proverbs from Hell, in which he says, exuberance is beauty. My friends, you are about to meet with some very beautiful exuberance. Won't you please join me in welcoming Lisa Starr. to be organized you know it doesn't work with me so bear with me I actually gave a lot of thought to this reading but it changes all day long uh, I'm glad to be back here and to recognize so many friends and see so many new ones and to work with this extraordinary group of young women um, it wasn't work I learned all day long about Ovid's metamorphosis, about, um, how do you pronounce it? Um, Alyssa, you said best, it's the Valkyries, but most people say it this way. I'm just scribbling notes. So um, these young women, and sometimes there are young men with us this year, it just happened to be young female poets with us. Um, your minds and hearts are as alive, if not more so than mine once was, so thank you for pulling me along. I'd like to um, start by thanking Christy, of course, and the Mystic Arts Cafe, and everybody that makes this happen. I'd like to thank the young women I work with today. Casey, where are you, sweetheart? Jesus, God, you're dangerous. Your parents should never be in the room with you, because I know how I am with my kids. I can't even stand up. Um, but I will focus and say that I'd like to um, dedicate my reading tonight. This is something I've never done. I'd like to dedicate my reading tonight to my friend Mary Oliver, who died just a couple months ago. And um, she wasn't just my hero, but she was my friend. And um, the one, there are many good things about death. <laughs> there are. But one of the best things is that somehow they make us all appreciate how precious life is. Um, the fact that we thought everybody had every copy of Mary's books on their desk. And she's like number three on the New York Times bestseller list, you know. I don't think she wanted any of that. But I just thought I would start by reading a couple of her poems. Um, in December, Mary died in January, but in December when I visited her, um, she had a, a poem in her head of hers 
that she couldn't remember. She only remembered this one line, and it was really bothering her that she couldn't remember the poem. And my great friend, Tricia, who's been Mary's care give her these last three years, we kept trying to find the poem and none of us could find it. Mary only had this one line in mind. She kept saying, if it's oh, uh, 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 uh. And so Trish and I tried Googling that, you know, and, and, and Mary had a few more of the words. And um, I said, Mary, maybe we don't need Google for this poem, where are all your books? And she sent me up to her bookshelf and I found them all and we went through each of her books together over the course of three days and we couldn't find the poem. And the one poem of hers that I was carrying in my backpack is a book of her new and selected poems, her first new and selected poems, which came probably out in like 1988 or something. It was given to me by my first godmother, a woman named Emily Reeve, who lived on Block Island. And when she left Block Island, she gave me her most prized possession, which was her collection of Mary's new and selected poems. She signs it with a simple, for Lisa, with love and respect, she was thanking me for running the poetry series. So Mary couldn't find this poem. We went through all of the books of hers that she had, and I said, well, Mary, I've got your new one selected in my backpack. Let's look through that. And Mary read through this book, poem by poem, and finally found this one, and said, this is it, and did this. And for all the Mary Oliver poems that I've known for all these years, this is one that I overlooked, and I, I can't imagine how I ever overlooked it. It's called Singapore. In Singapore, in the airport, a darkness was ripped from my eyes. In the women's restroom, one compartment stood open. A woman knelt there washing something in the white bowl. Disgust argued in my stomach and I felt in my pocket for my ticket. A poem should always have birds in it. Kingfishers say with their bold eyes and gaudy wings. Rivers are pleasant and of course trees. A waterfall, or if that's not possible, a fountain rising and falling. A person wants to stand in a happy place in a poem. When the woman turned, I could not answer her face. Her beauty and her embarrassment struggled together, and neither could win. She smiled, and I smiled. What kind of nonsense is this? Everybody needs a job. Yes, a person wants to stand in a happy place in a poem, but first we must watch her as she stares down at her labor, which is dull enough. She is washing the tops of the airport ashtrays as big as hubcaps with a blue rag. Her small hands turn the metal scrubbing and rinsing. She does not work slowly nor quickly, but like a river. Her dark hair is like the wing of a bird. I don't doubt for a moment that she loves her life. And I want her to rise up from the crust and the slop and fly down to the river. This probably won't happen but maybe it will. If the world were only pain and logic, who would want it? That was the line. Of course it isn't. Neither do I mean anything miraculous, but only the light that can shine out of a life. I mean the way she unfolded and refolded the blue cloth, the way her smile was only for my sake. I mean the way this poem is filled with trees and birds. That's Mary Oliver, who landed in a body. 
Mary has um, an astonishing, you know, I, I, every, most people who know my poems know I dropped out of school a bunch of times because most people, except Lou Gabordi and Charlie Ewers, said if you keep writing about your dead daughter and your dead dad, no one's going to read your poems. Well, Mary Oliver kept writing about her dogs, and look where it got her. And she did write a beautiful, they did publish a book of her poems called Dog Songs. <clears throat> anyway, this was a little bit of a lighter poem, but not so much, you know? She builds so much into every line. And she did that just by living with love. I mean, there was no ego in Mary. This poem's called The First Time Percy Came Back. So Percy was one of her final dogs. She's got another poem. Um, it's called Percy and Book. She says, our, our new dog name for the beloved poet unfortunately ate our copy of the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Fortunately, there are many copies of this book to be had. Each day as he grows into the wild fullness of his life, we pet his curly head and say, oh, wisest of little dogs, because <laughs> he ate the book. Anyway, when brother died, my most recent and beloved dog, Mary said, just wait a couple weeks and then read the first time Percy came back. So here it is. The first time Percy came back, he was not sailing on a cloud. He was loping along the sand as though he had come a great way. Percy, I cried out and reached to him. Those white curls. But he was unreachable. As music is present, yet you can't touch it. Yes, it's all different, he said. You're going to be very surprised. But I wasn't thinking of that. I only wanted to hold him. Listen, he said, I miss that too. And now you'll be telling stories of my coming back and they won't be false and they won't be true, but they'll be real. And then... As he used to, he said, let's go. And we walked down the beach together. So that's my introduction. A little bit of Mary Oliver, my dear, dear friend, our dear friend, our elder, and somebody who held the space for so much of what we love and couldn't name, you know? When she died, what I loved about that, and I was in her home with her when she died, what I loved was the gasp sort of spreading around the world, like she was everybody's Mary Oliver. And what I loved the most was that she maybe got a chance to feel that. She was so private and shy about her gifts. Christy does such an amazing job with this whole series, as we know. And there have been so many press releases about this event and all the others. And, and the work that you do, Christy, you know, we all appreciate it. Um, he did send this poem out in a big thing about a week ago. It's called What It Takes. So you saw it on the page. I know I read it here last year. I'll just say it again because um, it's different sometimes to hear it rather than to see it. And sometimes it's better without some noisy poet like me in the way. What it takes. All it takes is one blue rowboat tied to a buoy and its reflection in this moment for me to go remembering everything. Then a murmur, the sound of water lapping, the breeze snapping, and the way the leaves resist the letting go or don't. The wheels of a bicycle soaring downhill with some gravity glad rider, all of it, all of it, complicit. What I'm talking about is the sheer shimmering faith of the rope that connects the boat to the buoy and the hands that tied the knot 
and the fathers who teach their sons and daughters these simple things I see all day and sometimes not at all. Moments like this become miracle, oracle. And I know in my heart again that the whole world, this one, look around, this one, the whole world, this one, is just my own face in the mirror. And I know that I am the boat and the buoy and the rope. And like faith calf, that holy smoke, I am brilliant and bobbing and blue. Um, my next book is Christy Mentioned. I finished it three years ago. Believe it or not, I have very little confidence in myself these days. It might come as a big surprise, but it's the damn truth. So don't come up to me afterwards and tell me I'm great. It won't work. Just go out the door. But I do have a book of poems that kind of, I mean, for my kids are 21 and 22. So for the last 22 years, the poems have mostly been about them. And this book is thick with them. And hopefully, the book is freeing enough that it's not about them. It's about anyone that ever got a chance to love a child. And it doesn't have to be your own child. The way my brother and sister love my children, the way bus drivers love kids that they get to and from school safely, the way gym teachers teach gym class. So anyway. If the book ever comes out, it will be titled Potluck. And here's a signature poem. I read it here last year. You've probably all heard it before. I like it. Potluck. His voice, quiet now, is how I know to listen. These hushed conversations are always lovely. And he is telling her about this thing, this open house, which is funny enough, because after all, it's a school. It's not a house. Anyway, he's saying real no-nonsense, you'll get to see my chalkboard and probably maybe even Sally the snake. And she is nodding, eyes wider than wide, just thinking of it all. And then he is telling her real quiet now about the dinner. And he says, you know, they call it potluck. And you can tell he loves the way it sounds, though he is all business. It's called potluck. He says again, this phrase, it bears repeating, but I think it's just a dinner party. <laughs> and she is almost four and he is just five and I race back into the kitchen just in time to see her eyes come alive. Race up to the rack on the wall where we hang our pots and pans and then she says, yeah, as if she understands. Her eyes are bright brown, they are dancing, and oh, you can tell she loves the way it feels just to say it. Yeah, she says again, all nodding. Potluck, she whispers, electric, still staring at the rack, and she is smiling, and I am smiling, and we are basking in the joy of it, the joy of all these pots, the joy of so much luck. So um, I didn't, he overused it the way kids do in conversation. You know, they hear something and they don't know what it means. So he was five and it was his first time in school and there was this big potluck dinner. So there were posters up all over the school like kindergarten through second brings salads, third through fifth brings desserts. So he was just kind of bouncing off it off us at home. He, he was just like, so the big potluck's coming up. And he, he just, you know, like thumbs up here. So I guess, I guess we'll be bringing fruit or salad. And I just loved that he didn't know what it meant. <laughs> and who knows what it means? Sure works, doesn't it? Um, here's, a, here's a poem uh, written, um, I don't do well in academia, if that hasn't occurred to you yet. Um, 
I forget what you said about me graduating from UConn, but it, it took about 12 years and a lot of slow turns. You know, I hit Block Island after the third semester and I met Teresa, that was problematic. Christine was around, Katie. But I do dance in and out of the um, academic ritual. So I did teach Writing 101 at the university over at Island for a few times. And um, inevitably, I was teaching basic writing, so you had to teach like community, family, relationship, write an essay on this. And, uh, and so um, anyway, this one semester when I was teaching, um, I let the kids write an essay on a topic of their choice, which is even more problematic than writing about community or family. And so anyway, um, then I blew off grading their papers, and then suddenly their next papers were due. So it's a Sunday night, and I've got 90 essays to read. And um, the morning boat is leaving early. And I'm just basically grading them based on the number of marks I'm making on their paper, which is terrible. Um, and, I, and then I got to this one essay, and the, the paper was written so poorly that I got to a sentence that actually roused me from my delirium. Like who in my class could be writing a sentence this bad? And when I looked, it happened to be the uh, shyest kid in the class. And, um, and the title of her essay was called On Permanent Goodbyes. And that just made me give me a double take that this kid that could barely even raise her hand when I called her name had given me her heart. So the prelude to the poem is much longer to the poem, thank God. Here it is. Um, the, the, um, the epigraph that, com that, that, that comes after the title is actually the, the, the line itself from her paper. And I did, out of respect, change her name. For a student in one of my basic writing classes, the line is, not only are permanent goodbyes the worse, with an E, not a T. Not only are permanent goodbyes the worst, but it is one of the most horrible things about life in general. Excerpt from a student's essay written by the author's choice on saying goodbye. May I just say that I love you, Lauren Lanucci, and that somehow your paper made me weep. You will find the words eventually. You will learn to live with grief. Surely your diction will improve. <laughs> but your heart, your heart is home already. My young friend, you got this sentence wrong about eight different ways, but that bit about permanent goodbyes? A plus, A plus. A plus. That's how that goes. Okay, uh, a little change of pace. I'm still recovering from a life that I left, you know? And um, I don't need to talk too much about that. But um, when you build a life for yourself and certain things go wrong, it takes a long, long time to recover from everything that you built. Um, that you believed in and that was very real at the time. This poem's called Piano Lesson. About four weeks and some loose change into our split, you came for the piano. It was no surprise we'd agreed at last, at least on that. I knew I would miss it. In particular, her dashing up to it and the extraordinary effort, effort of her boundless motion settling. The chatter slowed to humming, the straightening of books, of shoulders, of back, the shaking of her head a few times quickly for instant focus, and then all the energy harnessed, relegated to the brown eyes which nearly jump in their effort to stay fixed on a single page, her eternally at the ready, perpetually moving, miraculous body slowed into stopping into practice. 
Of course, I'd thought I'd to prepare myself to miss the way that she, turning sheets of music, might say, Mommy, oh, never mind, I was going to ask you something, but I can't now, because I'm practicing. And then with a cleansing breath, like the one I could never get quite right in Lamaze, get right back to it. <laughs> oh, I was prepared for the piano to go, and so, in some degree, its player, or so so I thought, but it blinded me. Like when my Achilles snapped, rippling up my calf and throwing me three feet before I landed, and even then I didn't realize it was gone. I kept trying to stand and so kept falling like that deer I struck the night I went for a drive after a fight so bad, I knew it was our last. Anyway, that's how it felt the first time I called you and heard our little girl playing the piano through a telephone. <sighs> okay. Um, I read this one here last year. I know we're ready for it now. So even if you heard it before, I think we need it. And even if you don't think it's funny, laugh hard. <laughs> Mama bear, post game. We were on teams together. Mama bear, post game. You're a coach. You know, those terrible parents in the stands? Who knew I had it in me? I am so upset that they lost by one, so disappointed for their disappointment, never mind that it all came down to a few really bad calls and some epically terrible officiating that I rush her without realizing it as she approaches the locker room. What are you doing, she asks, mildly annoyed to be, see me by her side. We lost, that's all. We just lost. And you want to know what's even better? Now I have to go to the next 15 minutes of history. And she storms into the locker room and unable to prevent myself, I do too. <laughs> Her teammates are in various stages of changing and looking for phone chargers and notebooks, and I need Millie to know, I need them all to know that they did not lose, that the game was stolen from them. <laughs> Millie, hurting because she fell so many times and angry at herself for the missed foul shots and angry at me because I am ridiculous, says in her team captain voice, we lost because we didn't rebound. And I say, no, you're wrong. And I say to all their sweaty, gorgeous, racing to history and English and chemistry faces, make no mistake, girls. You lost because that pathetic ref with the awful toupee had a very unhappy childhood, and now he is trying to take away yours. Millie's head pops through her sweater, one eye raised through anger into curiosity. Mom, she says, I just have to ask if you think this is helping in any way. Do you think you are making anyone feel better? And by the way, what are you doing in our locker room? Are you the new team mother now? And though she doesn't slam her locker door, she closes it derisively, grabs her backpack, and heads off to class with the others. Left alone, I tidy things up like those cheerful bathroom attendants I adore in the Charlotte airport and help myself to a leftover orange wedge and answer my know-it-all daughter's question. Yes. I say to her, though she is already sitting at her desk upstairs, I do think it's helping. I'm actually feeling much better now. <laughs> and I take another orange wedge and dump the rest and rinse the plate. Then I get in the truck, drive home, and write this. <laughs> So 
So two kids, Oren has dodged the bullet tonight. Here's a poem about Oren. Um, my kids are both going to be graduating from college in May. And they are astonishing the way we all feel about our kids. Um, in my case, my kids had a really, really, really glorious childhood being raised on that island, so exposed to nature and family. Um, they went through a really tough time when our marriage turned towards hell. And instead, they chose the higher ground. They were exposed to a lot of anger. And what they chose is the best of each of us. Um, so that's a long story short. The school on Block Island didn't work out so well for my son. Um, he was in a different peer group. And, and the kids were really kind of self, it's a family out there the way it is in most small towns. At any rate, uh, Oren shifted and, and went to Moses Brown in Providence, and it turned out to be a life-changing thing for him. He needed to get the big fish small, in the small town thing kicked out of him, and it did at Moses Brown in every glorious way. It paved the way for the rest of his life, actually. Um, so here's a poem called God Blesses New School. I hope I remember it. The God bless this new school is because he was, you know, I'm, uh, you know, whatever. However we feel about God or spirit. In a Quaker school, you don't really differentiate. In me, I've, I do, I find God in pickles or skid knees. And in particular, a zipper down. God's usually there. With all the clumsiness, God is there, I would hope, at least my God. God bless this new school. Waking heavy again. The middle-agedness of me settling in like some combination of glacier and baggy stockings. I long sigh through breakfast. And without even thinking, say aloud to my 15-year-old son, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Only when he stops doing it to answer, do I realize he's been whistling. And he says without pausing, you just need to be happy, Mom. And he looks straight through me with this new, shy, bold smile he has as if he has just now realized how easy life can be and his own happiness humbles him just enough. The moment clearly calls for weeping, but I resist. I tell him to hurry or we'll be late. He stuffs computer, notebooks, a meal card into his backpack. In 30 minutes, he'll be taking a midterm exam. He has acne, a mouth full of braces. And did you hear what I said? He was whistling. And... I think we've heard so many poems tonight that I'm going to end. I'm gonna, I've got three more poems. Feels reasonable. Is that okay? Three more? This is a long one. Um, it came out of a workshop that I ran at the Block Island Poetry Project. Um, my friend Jen Lighty, my friend and my teacher, ran a workshop. I, every year I would just say, just teach what you want to teach. So this year she said, I'm, su um, I'm studying the seven directions. You know, So Aboriginal cultures don't necessarily honor one god. They might honor many. They might honor wind, sun. It varies. In Jen's thinking this one year, there were seven. And she ran a workshop where she asked us to consider the seven directions. She named them. And she actually asked us to sit for a couple hours and consider the fact that we actually, you know, it's so funny. Um, it's not funny. It's very real. The notion of ego and no ego. Right, because at our best, we're just part of the machine. You know, I was just talking to the girls about Mary Oliver, and in one of her essays in Upstream, she says, may I be the tiniest nail in the house of the universe, but may I be useful. So that's the egoless part. The other part is the part that like somebody like Nelson Mandela calls into question when he says our greatest fear is not that we're powerless, it's that we're powerful beyond measure. 
So somehow in the middle of it all, right, we've been given this life by our parents. We were born because our parents did what they did, and here we are, and somehow our lives are meant to make some kind of a difference. It might just be holding the door for somebody, right? The sun comes up, stars, the moon, they're doing this dance for us in the middle of it all. Maybe they're doing it for us. That's what Jen asked us to dare to imagine. So imagine that you could ask them questions and they were really listening. Take some time and think about what you would ask them and then go take a walk and see how they answer. So the poem will start with a list of questions and the answers come quicker. I question the seven sacred directions and they answer. Questions, air, who taught you to touch my hair that way? Which chest of which bird is your favorite? Why so moody? Fire, could you control yourself if you had to? You know I'm not afraid to look you in the eye, don't you? Are you ever sorry when the bars when the barn collapses on the bleeding cows? Do you have a lover? Water. If it's not true that I'm your daughter, will you lie to me? Which do you like better, the calm or the storm? Earth. Can you feel my embrace? Do you ever just want to throw your hands up and walk away from it all? Do you plan your reactions or do they just happen? Above, do you really listen to our prayers and our songs? Are you ever lonely? Do you weep more when we make peace or war? Below, who taught you your patience? Are there moments when we all dance together? Within, why this fist around my belly? Can't you do something about this sorrow? Answers. Because you are my daughter, you shouldn't have had to ask. For every question, one blade of grass. For every sorrow, one golden shaft of wheat. For your loneliness, I give you children laughing. Have you seen me blow and ripple through the tall grass? It's like that with your hair. As for the cows, I'm sorry for their fear, but one day you will understand that even their pain is necessary. Walk away from all this green, never. And about my lover, none of your business. <laughs> and one more thing, dear one. Sometimes you are afraid to look me in the eye. And then, and only then, do I feel lonely. I started with Mary Oliver, and I will finish with a couple poems that I've written about her. This is called Snow in a Florida Breeze. I don't know if Mary is as ready to die as Coleman is or thinks he is, but if she is, this would be the time. A few more sunsets, that final sip of coffee, a week or so of morphine, then the smooth and always too fast sleigh ride downhill. Snow and a Florida breeze, and a swift re-entry into the light she never left, despite the many darks that tried to take it. I do know that when she comes back to see me, 
she will be riding on a cloud that looks like Percy. And I will run down the beach in the way I thought I'd forgotten faster and faster and faster until at last I catch up with her again. So my bestie Coleman, who introduced me to Mary, who is the translator of Rumi, those of you who know Rumi, that's the Coleman in these poems. Coleman had a stroke last night, and he's in the hospital right now, and he's pretty fragile. Here's a poem I wrote about Coleman and Mary a couple years ago. It's called Bear With Me, and the, um, the epigraph is from A.A. A. Milne. The line is, we'll be friends forever, won't we, Pooh, asked Piglet. Longer than that, Pooh answered. Bear with me while I try to describe the sight of Mary's arm tucked into Coleman's. The two of them taking such small and concentrated steps due to the fragility and the neuropathy or is it just the grace of God? Her arm and his, their slow and steady footsteps to the car from the restaurant, his low murmur, her unbridled laugh. Easy now. The three of us walked behind them. My daughter said, they're adorable. My friend said, I can't take it. I said, Pooh and Piglet. And so they seemed. Big old gentle bear, tiny fierce friend bundled in pink beside him, bolstered by each other for whichever wind comes next. The three of us watched as they inched toward the car, Mary's head resting lightly against his arm, holding hers. We watched love take careful steps, one at a time, and we followed. Way, way, way longer than forever. Easy now. Lisa Starr, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks also to Casey Flax. Where are you, Casey? It was wonderful. Thanks especially to the Poets Laureate of the High Schools of Southeastern Connecticut. Weren't they great? If you'd like to take a little Lisa Starr home with you tonight, we have some of her books instead, which I know she would be delighted to sign for you. Let me remind you that we'll be returning on April 12th with the great Mark Doty. Final thanks, as always, are to you. Good night. Take care. Mm -hmm.